Hello. Welcome to the spring 2021 faculty reading. Um, welcome all our accepted students who um, participated in sort of open house activities today. And uh, hello to everyone in the SBU family. Uh, my name is Ariana McLean. I am a current graduate student at the MFA uh, Creative Writing and Literature Program at Stony Brook University in my I guess I'm finishing up my second year here, which is crazy. Um, so we have a amazing lineup of our faculty um, tonight for you. We have a lucky 13 readers. Um, there are so many publications, awards, fellowships in this group of writers that um, I'm not going to actually list them all out like I normally do um, when I um, MC events um, on YouTube. But please look up all our faculty online if you don't already know them. Um, they have their personal website, publisher pages, and the stonybrook.edu uh, website as well. So shall we get started? Um, we'll start with our first reader is Amy Hempel. Amy is my teacher right now this semester, um, sharing her love for fragments. Um, she teaches uh, short fiction here at Stony Brook and her published works include Sing to It, The Dog of the Marriage, Tumble Home, At the Gates of the Animal Kingdom, and Reasons to Live. So let's hear from Amy. Thank you, Ariana. And uh, you're getting an A in the class. Um, I'm zooming in tonight from Florida. Um, and if you'd like to see the terrifying thing I saw on my walk this afternoon in a wetlands preserve, Google, when this, is, this event is over, Google high walking alligator, not just alligator, high walking al alligator. That might be my last, uh, wetlands preserve walk. Um, I'm actually going to read a, a little bit from um, the longest piece in Sing to It that is set in that very wetlands preserve part of it. There is a wetlands preserve a couple of miles from my house where for a small donation, you can walk the beautiful acres that are home to many kinds of birds and wildlife. At the trailhead, there is a whiteboard where hikers can write down what they saw each day. You can expect to see gators, ibis, wood storks, and herons. And one day a joker who preceded me wrote penguin. On my next pass under sightings, I wrote children. By the time I returned, it had been erased. Someone had written lawyer and drawn a frowny face beside it. The next time I went to the preserve, I wrote on the whiteboard, steel horse, and went back later in the day to see if anyone got it, and was glad to see that someone had written two words before and two words after mine, completing the line from Bon Jovi, on a steel horse I ride. The other sightings on the board that day were common king snake, Brahmini blind snake, 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 Chihuahua snake. This part of Florida, not on the ocean, not on the Gulf, is for now exempt from the threat of flooding, though a hurricane will take down trees, and the northern part of town is part of Lightning Alley. It's home for now, but where does one ever feel at home? It is Valentine's Day, and we hear that up north it is so cold that flower vendors are losing a fortune, the flowers freezing before they can be delivered, which probably boosts sales for purveyors of chocolate. This is either cyclic or a new and ominous development for the planet. A real estate broker tried to interest me in a house on the Gulf Coast when I was still looking, and when I asked how many years till it would be underwater, the broker said, why bring up the controversy? Climate change, the controversy. The broker said it had not hurt sales at any of the beaches yet, not even Miami or St. Pete expected to be the first to go under. 
I don't need flowers or chocolate today, but because I need a pick me up and I'm not carrying cash, I drive over to the college campus where planted throughout, there is a kind of holly called yopon, the berries of which are poisonous, but if you chew a handful of leaves, they work on you like caffeine. Half an hour's drive from my house is a prison town. The prison is a serious one at that. Put to death there, Ted Bundy for one. It's not a town where you wanna stop for gas and you'll get a ticket for driving two miles over the limit. I've only known one person who was imprisoned, a guy I went out with once. He was smug, I thought, but this was back when I gave people a chance. So we met at a movie theater and had to wait in line for half an hour. Lucky I brought something to read, he said. Ha, what a dick. Not long after, I heard he was doing time for embezzlement. Asked myself, going to learn this time? Okay, another time. Next time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, up next, we have uh, Genevieve Sly Crane. Uh, she is not only a faculty member, but also a graduate of the MFA uh, Creative Writing Program at Stony Brook. Her debut novel, Sorority, won the 2020 Whiting Award for Fiction. And this semester, she is teaching a fiction workshop on modern phantoms, which I've heard great things about. So Genevieve, let's give it up for you. Thank you. And Amy, I, I Googled high walking alligator and immediately regretted it. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to be reading an excerpt of um, a novel that I have coming out with Simon and Schuster early next year uh, about a woman who steals identities and lives out those identities for two year increments throughout her life. Um, so this is the real identity of, of one of the people that she uh, steals from. In old age, June Cleary stared at the small inventory of her life, a house with vinyl siding and sharp white trim, a loyal smelly dog, now her third, a neighbor whom she'd attacked with a garden hose when he tried to deadhead her roses, and a sense that she had missed something, but nonetheless emerged from a battlefield relatively unscathed. Her deterioration began slowly and exploded in an exponential decline. In the early days, she repeated herself, how about that? How about that? Before she began repeating errands. She was twice at the bank in one day, and then on another occasion, she made that humiliating sojourn to the grocery store and bought a birthday card for Henrik, now dead 26 years. Sweet cashier Emily had chatted with her at checkout, and when she noted the card and June said that it was for Henrik, Emily had said, Mrs. Cleary, he's gone, hun. he He's been gone. And she patted the back of Mrs. Cleary's hand as if she were trying to wake a sleeping passenger on an airplane for drink service. Everyone in a nursing home has an inciting incident that leads them there. In June's case, it had been the embarrassing fiasco with the man who'd come to check the gas meter at the back of her house. She sprang at him with a metal rake. An officer came, there were phone calls. Her son, she suspected, was on the periphery, but she had no proof, no contact. In this new place, this narrow bed, this unfamiliar room, her memory grew weedy and encroached on the borders of fact. Only the microscopic and visceral remained. The Katsopoulos family across the street, what had become of them? The dour housefrau, Mrs. Katsopoulos, with her bony hairless ankles protruding from her cigarette pants, a teaspoon bent in half and lying on the kitchen floor, half in a window pane of sunlight, the room reflected in curved miniature, silvered. Her grandfather, who had inexplicably worn women's knee highs under his trousers, the sensation of her older brother holding her in suspension, her arms stretching to top the Christmas tree with a paper mache angel with tarty cheeks and the prickling of branches on her neck, her face. That was the true summation of a life. It hung itself on moods and minutes. The rest was safely stored somewhere else, significant enough to keep, but not significant enough to recall. When she saw her son's face, it was almost as if someone had pulled a sheet off of a body in a morgue, an unwanted resurrection. Too much, too much. The burden of her whole living, the horrible pulling reality of having a husband, a son, a dog, a birthday card, white trim, of a world still in motion beyond the borders of her bed, waiting for her to get up and return to it. Too much, too much. Her scream was a benediction, a beg. I give you this terror to keep you awake, now go. 
and her son evaporated into the world and everything righted itself back to a thing tidy and small, a spoon bin on the floor, a chess piece, a garden hose not thrown. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Genevieve. I realize I didn't say this at the top of our program, but we have a, a chat in YouTube. So feel free to write any comments, uh, questions you have um, throughout the reading. And we'll try to get to um, some questions toward the end. Uh, so, but feel free to add as you have thoughts. So let's get on with it. Our next uh, reader is Michelle Whitaker. Michelle is also a Stony Brook alum, having graduated from uh, the MFA program as well. Uh, she is a poet and a musician and an assistant professor in the program of writing and rhetoric at Stony Brook University. Her debut book, Surge, was the uh, 2018 Next Generation Indie Book Award finalist for poetry. So, Michelle, let's hear what you have to say. Welcome. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Ariana. It's nice to see you again. And thanks, Bob, for the invite. Um, it's nice to be among friends. Um, I'm going to read two poems. Um, the first one is called Partial Life Review, and it's after Marie Howe's um, part of Eve's discussion. It's not about Eve, but I love that poem so much, so it's in dialogue with it. Partial Life Review. It was like the moment when a rare pine wobbler flew over the highway lane just before entering those shelf clouds in the near distance, just before you saw the wall of rain leaving inches of itself further down the road before hydroplanking disturbances. Before a moment, you felt this deluge as a divine sanction or sweet suspicion like the over-arousal of when a hatchback's tires and brakes disagree as a steering committee, or very much like when you are kept, when you kept checking for the headlights in the rearview mirror, when for a moment you're offered a clarity about why your partner paints these bamboo shoots over and over, and when you don't have the heart to answer when being asked again if this time looks like the real thing, when no, the nature of it still looks to me like your cancer. This one is so about a breakup or right before the breakup. <laughs> On the last day of becoming us or unbecoming us, take your pick. We were dead thistles, but we pinched back. We were warped, but we were barbed. We had playtime, but we spangled blood. We were carapaces, but fermenting faith. We followed an eviction, but I'll admit I was afraid. We were internal wars, but plucked guitars. So what if we broke soft bones from yield signs? We were dirty nail beds swabbed with moonshine. We were matted water, but lumbered tongues. Isn't this romantic? We were grown here like invasive cathedrals. We ripped up Rembrandt's light, but last seen in our photos, we were chapel ceilings of indolent beliefs. We were crucifixes lost between breasts. We were landmark years, but milliseconds, hunting for heaven by pretending we were centipedes, hiding in pillow shams. Even if we did not admit, could not admit our exposed nerves, we both knew deep into the proximity of suffering alone, we were glory thieves of each other's power. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it's good to see you as well. Um, Michelle was um, a reader for our undergrad creative writing program um, last Wednesday. So you can check that on, out on YouTube. Um, our next reader is Susan Minot. Susan is a novelist, a short story writer, a poet, and a screenwriter. She's the author of Monkeys, Evening, Lust, and Other Stories, Folly, Rapture, and a poetry collection titled Poems for AM. Uh, 
she teaches short fiction at the Manhattan campus. Um, so let's give it up for Su Susan Minot. I better unmute myself. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to read something from my most recent book, which is actually called, ironically, Why I Don't Write. And this is a, um, this is from the, the title story. And it's, the, it starts out as being why someone doesn't write, i.e. the things that keep you from, from, or that keep you procrastinating. But it, it ends up being kind of a, a drones look at what goes on kind of in our brains. And I think we've got more, more kind of bits of things entering our brains because of the computer uh, than, than maybe we used to. What do you do all day, she said. In the morning, there is the counter with the teapot and the bag of tea in a white cup, the milk from the carton in the fridge door, the chair, which chair? the paper, the notebook, which notebook, the folder, the letters on the screen, the emails asking, the computer keyboard, then it all stops. She handed me the paper. Here's the bad news, she said. Before waking, I found a deep slash in my upper arm. Out of the opening floated small lobsters. Overheard. Telling someone your goal makes it less likely to happen. Your system must be overloaded or you have a virus. Where was the daughter? She was frozen, head bent down, her face awash in a light blue glow as if spotlit by aliens. Her finger flicked over the screen like a conductor. What's going on with the weather? Arthur Rambo gave up writing poetry at age 21. Something dripping, life is not right. 53 dead, including the shooter. You are in the wrong line. Your line is over there. You write if you have to. Hunger, headache. Death estimates ran from 150 to 500, but could not be confirmed. Marinated in the soy, oil, garlic, sugar mixture. Will be subject to late fees. Come to bed. Open any page of Emily Dickinson and have the top of your head taken off. No one saying, come to bed. He got another one, prettier, younger. How delicious is that? The ways that Bob Dylan says he's all right. One, he's all right. And two, he's not all right. Stars splash sky, wind in the grass, bees seeming to be in fast motion, burrowing in a flower, a flower you never saw before. Women writers without children, many, Women writers with children, few. Of the billions of creatures alive today and of the billions of creatures who have lived, not one has come up with an adequate explanation of why we are here. On her deathbed, she said in a shaky voice, we had a good time, didn't we? The pipes are shot, need to be redone. Another story will come. Thank you, Susan. Our next reader is Roger Rosenblatt. Roger is a distinguished professor of English and writing. He's an essayist, a novelist, author of six off-Broadway plays and 18 books, including Lampham Rising, Making Toast, Kayak Morning, and Boy Detective. He teaches uh, writing in multiple genres at Stony Brook. And this semester, his, uh, the topic is, you call that a book? Let's give it up for Roger Rosenblatt.
There we go. Hello. <clears throat> what an honor to be uh, among such wonderful writers and readers. Um, we were chapel ceilings of indolent beliefs, wrote my former student, this beautiful poet, Michelle Whitaker. That's enough to brace you for an evening and all of you. Um, Cold Moon was a book uh, came out in October. It's part thought, part love song. I'll read you. It's, it exists in sections the way I tend to write in jazz movements. And um, this particular section has both or tries to have both the parts, thought, part, love song. Ingenuity is impressive, irrespective of its uses, don't you think? I mean, how those divers in Thailand figured out a way to extricate the boys' soccer team trapped in a cave moving over two miles underwater through snake-like caverns, swaddling the boys to protect them in the water. Ingenious. But no more so than the English in colonial America who gave smallpox infected blankets to the Native Americans to exterminate the race. Or the person who invented the cluster bomb. I saw how that worked in Beirut. A child grows curious about a metal object lying on the ground. He touches it and the cluster bomb rises str up, straight up, three feet in the air, just the height of a child. Then, because the bomb is composed of a compact cluster of metal fragments, it explodes like a hailstorm. Bye-bye, baby. Impressive, no? Think how much ingenuity went into the construction of the A-bomb starting from the work of Einstein, Oppenheimer, and Fermi. Many of the best scientific minds in the country clustered at Los Alamos and, and figured out how free neutrons hitting the nucleus of a ur uranium atom would result in the most destructive weapon ever made. In Hiroshima, in the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, one may inspect the consequences of the work. Pictures of melting flesh, horses with their legs blown off, a molten pocket watch. Breathtaking, all the uses people make of creative thinking. Rachmaninoff, Gershwin, the divers in Thailand, Bach, Vermeer, the inventor of the cluster bomb, Oppenheimer, Einstein, Wordsworth, Shakespeare, Knox, your socks off. Would they be impressed with one another, say, at a convention of ingenious geniuses? Would they sit around one of the lethally boring tables at Aspen and applaud one another for their insights? for the way each of them survived the situation and proceeded to change it dramatically. Would Vermeer slap Fermi on the back and say, way to go, man, in Dutch, of course. And yet I look at you and all these people disappear. Yesterday, for instance, when we were having breakfast in the diner and you looked at our 50 something Latina waitress with her morning smile competing with her exhausted eyes and then at me, do we have a hundred dollars to leave her for a tip, you said. And when our waitress could not believe what we did and kept looking alternately at the money and at us, and you said a New Year's gift to remove the sting of charity from the gesture. You did all that with your ingenious eye and your ingenious heart. Impressive. Thank you, Roger. Oh, I'm really enjoying this uh, reading. I hope everyone else is so just fantastic. Um, our next reader is Molly Godry. Molly holds a PhD in experimental prose from the University of Utah. She's a multi-genre writer, genre bending writer. Uh, she's the author of the verse novel, we, T we Take Me Apart and its sequel, Desire a Haunting. Uh, Molly teach this semester is teaching poetry and co-teaching our teaching practicum or practicum in teaching, which is uh, part of the Stony Brook MFA program uh, curriculum. So Molly, I look forward to hearing what you have to read tonight. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you for that. It's good to see everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm just going to read a page from uh, a book called Fit Into Me. It's the third in my interrelated uh, projects. Um, 
I think this is toward the very, very end. I guess what I'll say is that uh, this book is a memoir and then inside the memoir is a novel. And this page is the end of the novel, but it's actually the nonfiction narrator. Um, maybe the morning after the masquerade ball, they get out of bed together. Maybe they don't. Maybe Connie gets out of bed alone and takes a shower to clean off her blood and his glitter. Or maybe Travis joins her. Maybe in the shower, they decide to prolong the inevitable. Maybe he says, let me stay another day and help you clean the house. And maybe she lets him. Maybe they get out of the shower, get dressed, go downstairs and work together all day and all afternoon and into the evening cleaning the house. Maybe she's gotten too used to having his help around the house. Or maybe she begins to realize how much she appreciates his help. Maybe now she doesn't want him to go really. And maybe she won't tell him to go after all. Maybe after the house is clean and after they shower again because they're disgusting and sweaty and coated in party grime, the soles of their shoes sticky with spilled beer, their hair gross and somehow also gritty. Yes, maybe after all this, they are freshly bathed and lying on a shaggy rug in the nursery in front of an electric fireplace, wearing thick wool socks and terry cloth robes, pretending they are young again and watching Fantasia 2000. Maybe in the middle of Fantasia 2000, she escapes to the kitchen to make blueberry oatmeal pancakes. And maybe she distracts herself by watching the blueberries pop in the heat of the cast iron skillet, bubbling, nearly caramelizing. Maybe she slices strawberries for topping over clotted cream. Maybe back in the nursery now as they eat, she listens to the crisp crunch of the oatmeal in his every chewy mouthful, comforted by the smoothness of the clotted cream and the perfect tart and cold of those fresh washed strawberries at the finish, mango mimosas in their mismatched juice glasses, coffee black for Travis and with cream for her in two tiny gold rim teacups, their French press and a cow shaped creamer and their dirty plates on a Florentine tray on the hearth at their feet, the darkness of that early winter New Year's evening and Stravinsky's Firebird Sweet playing softly on TV. Maybe after Travis eats, he naps, his head in her lap, her fingers in his hair. Maybe she wraps the both of them up together in heavy blankets and watches Fantasia 2000 again, straight through to the end, thinking about the tea house and how it belongs to no one else but her now. Or maybe none of this happens. Maybe the morning after the masquerade ball, she gets up, gets out of bed, takes a shower, comes back, and tells Travis it's been great, but it's time for him to go. Thanks for everything. Maybe she helps him pack his car. Easy enough. He owns nothing more than a medium-sized duffel bag and a cardboard box of paperback books. Maybe she says goodbye, wishes him luck, waves as he backs down the drive. Maybe he's hurt by this, actually really, truly hurt by this, but so what? So he isn't happy, who is? And anyway, in truth, he can't say he isn't surprised. Are you? Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, our next reader is Matthew Clam. Uh, Matthew Clam is a fiction writer and a journalist and satirist, and he's the author of Sam the Cat and Other Stories and Who is Rich? He teaches both uh, fiction and nonfiction um, in our program. And this semester, his Saturday Intensive, I think has a great topic name, Creating Stories When You Can't Stay Silent. So I can't wait to hear what you have to share with us. Matt Clam. Uh, thanks, Ariana. And um, Molly, I really, uh, I love that piece you just read. Uh, I love the, that um, sort of provisional maybe idea. And I also, I haven't eaten yet. And I was getting really hungry listening to that. So, um, so uh, uh, for last year's um, fiction issue, the New Yorker assigned me a little sidebar, a short piece um, during this time of isolation, they asked us to, a uh, few fiction writers, to recall a close encounter with another person that had repercussions 
um, in their lives and in their thoughts and emotions uh, as a, a bit of an antidote to all this writing on loneliness and solitude. So I wrote this, it's called Let's Get Small. 1978, eighth grade, I'm five feet nine, 103 pounds, and I'm often mistaken for a girl. Dave, a kid in my homeroom, same height, blonde like me, is somehow fat and skinny at the same time. We both know Let's Get Small, the Steve Martin album. We're basically into the intellectual scene. And although we use it to transfix girls and keep cretins off balance, there's something else going on. In a romantic coupling, you turn inward, but friendships put you shoulder to shoulder to take on the world. Ninth grade, we drink vodka at Martha Cedar Homes and throw up in the street. I sleep over at Dave's house and it's comfortable. Our mothers like the same kind of pottery. My father, who's sometimes fun, is prone to rages and tantrums like a child, while Dave's father, also fun, is a child psychiatrist. His parents casually slip into French at breakfast. His three older sisters have been known to sit on him and put his, his hair in doll curlers, but they've also taught him how to have a conversation. 10th grade, we're in high school now, still no girlfriends. So for prom, we rent a limo with four other boys dressed by our fathers in blazers and loafers. We're not cool. And it's almost beside the point that two of the guys in the limo are on acid and one of them is a dwarf. For someone who feels anxious in a group, it's good to belong anywhere with anyone, with Dave. 11th grade, we have busboy jobs at Le Chateau, a big corny restaurant run by a mean French family in a stone mansion overlooking the Hudson Valley. The maitre d' is not so sure about us. Neither are the waiters, the captains, the wine guys, or Joseph who hired us or his Lieutenant Coos. Individually, we do a capable job of clearing, hauling trays and dish tubs, but as a team, we're incompetent and despised. The grandmother catches us eating food off people's plates. We're blamed for breaking the ice machine and the staff generates a growing list of insulting nicknames for us. But there's a wonderful smell of baguettes and paper bags. And on the drive home, we own the road, dissecting the strangeness of a menacing world. 12th grade, Mr. Enriquez's humor class. I memorize Steve Martin's The Gospel Maniacs, a bit about a corrupt TV minister, and perform it because religion is horseshit and comedy is a protest against small-mindedness. It doesn't go over with my classmates and Dave is the only one laughing for the entire four and a half minutes. College, even though ours is a bond based on achieving nothing, Dave gets into a very good college. I enroll at an underfunded state school because it's the place that let me in. This isn't the first time that one of us breaks stride and inadvertently wounds the other and it won't be the last. But the summer after freshman year, we work together doing pool construction. And on the way to work, he plays a tape of the radio show he DJs so that I can hear him dedicate a song to me, Cherry Tree by 10,000 Maniacs, about a guy so dumb he can't read. And I feel honored. There are months when I barely know what he's up to. I send him short stories and he sends me TV scripts and tapes of his band. At some point, I realize I've been imitating his laugh since ninth grade, and I make myself stop. Our 20s. In Minneapolis, I meet his first serious girlfriend, and he doesn't confide sexual details to me, doesn't treat her like an obstacle to our friendship, and we all get along. That night, even though almost everything in our lives is terrible, I've been living on a waiter's salary for years. He hates writing ad copy. We sound so sure of ourselves and are so good at mirroring, listening to, and inspiring each other that we tape an hour of our drunken jabbering. That tape la later lands in my mother's car and she plays it until it breaks. Our 30s. Dave moves to LA to try to get a TV show on the air. We settle into a cross country thing. While we're crashing at my aunt's house in Montauk, he points out that in a short story I recently published, a character named Dave is the obnoxious older brother. About this act of inexplicable hostility, I say almost nothing, and we never mention it again. Marriage, children, knee surgeries, work triumphs and disasters. In New York City, I see ads on taxis for a TV show he's created. 
but after two seasons, it's gone. Our friendship becomes superfluous, voluntary, sporadic. We tell each other the good things, the bad things we keep to ourselves. Eventually, we don't even share the good news. Sometimes I wonder if the friendship is merely commemorative, but then I see him. We assess the changes, throw a Frisbee, talk all night, drink and smoke a few disgusting cigarettes, and he's the same, a rambling guy, an overgrown eighth grader. He visited in January and left a jar of peanut butter and a bottle of vermouth. That may be all I see of him for a while. Thanks. Thank you. All right, our next reader is Patricia McCormick. Uh, Patricia is the author of several critically acclaimed novels, including Never Fall Down, Sold, and is also the co-author of I Am Malala. Uh, she teaches nonfiction creative writing here at the program. So welcome, Patricia McCormick. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read an essay that was just uh, rejected by the literary journal that inspired it. I was in the feminine hygiene aisle not long ago where a teenage girl was pretending not to shop for sanitary napkins when all at once I was flung back in time to my sixth grade classroom at Good Shepherd School. There was the smell of a bologna sandwich wrapped in wax paper. Sister Ellen George, her wimple pressing her forehead into a perpetual furrow. The woozy purple aroma of a fresh mimeo sheet. The crucifix on the wall, Jesus, a towel draped around his hips, his brow, his ribs, his hands, weeping blood. And Bonnie Pinkowski, a doughy pink faced girl who sat across the aisle from me. She was simple and kind and I loved her. We passed notes, held hands under our desks when Sister Ellen George wasn't looking. Even her name was enchanting, Bonnie. One morning, Bonnie in her blue uniform jumper and Peter Pan collar leaned across the aisle and told me she'd gotten her period over the weekend. My family threw a party, she said. I wasn't sure which unmoored me more, the fact that Bonnie had gotten her period or that her family knew. They'd had a cake, she'd said, and her grandfather had given her $5. I felt seasick. Your grandfather was there? I said, she said, yes, and her aunts and uncles. Your brother, I said, was he there? Sister Ellen George wrapped her desk with a wooden pointer, a signal to stop talking. I went back to my work, mortified for Bonnie. Her family was Polish, as in, I assumed, recently from Poland. Maybe this kind of peasant custom was okay back in the old country, but this was Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. It was 1969. A man had walked on the moon. But something other than condescension was stirring in me. I looked over at Bonnie. The space between our two wooden desks widened, then grew into a chasm. I felt Bonnie, my Bonnie, leaving me. When Bonnie raised her hand and asked to be excused, the code for a special exemption that girls received to go to the lavatory to change their Kotex pads, I ripped a sheet of paper out of my loose leaf binder and laid it on Bonnie's chair. It said, Bonnie Pinkowski, wipe your dirty ass here. The dark, messy atmosphere around menstruation wasn't the real reason Bonnie's party created such cognitive dissonance in my 12-year-old mind. All of it, the nun's warnings, my mother's behavior, an ad that said tampons were medically safe, even for married, unmarried girls, hinted of sex. And while I wasn't able to name it as such at the time, I'd already had my first sexual experience at six when a male relative had used me for a few moments of rough, furted pleasure, then set me aside while he washed up. Those few moments in a dimly lit room had taught me the harm that sex could inflict. And now as I saw the bodies around me undergoing such rude transformations, 
I was becoming afraid of the new ways sex could hurt me. It wasn't enough to snicker behind Bonnie's back. I had to inflict some harm of my own. It wasn't just that Bonnie was leaving me. It was that she was doing it with confidence. She was sailing into the future with the love and delight of her family. When Bonnie returned to the lavatory, she read my note with a frown, then crumpled it and tossed it in the trash can. Was she too sturdy to be hurt by my meanness? I tell myself all these years later, yes, that she was. And yet, if I could talk to her now, I tell her I've carried the memory of that afternoon in 1969 ever since. I am ashamed to this day. And I'm stunned that I could have been so mean, especially to Bonnie, my Bonnie. If I could talk to her now, I'd say, I wish I hadn't been so cruel. I'd also say this, I wish I'd been you. Thanks. Thank you. Mm, that was great. Um, next, our next reader is uh, Christian McLean, who sadly we are not related, um, but that was a fun, uh, when we met, uh, when I started the program, that was a fun uh, little coincidence. Um, Christian is a fiction writer, a playwright, and a poet. He's the author of Duck Hampton. He's also the co-director of the Southampton Writers Conference, and he teaches the, art, the practicum in arts in administration, which is part of the uh, Stony Brook curriculum as well. Christian, welcome. Hi, it's uh, great to be reading with so many uh, of our amazing faculty. I was talking to one of our alums yesterday and uh, we were talking about how, how uh, the, the, the students actually also influence the faculty as much as the faculty influences the students. So um, I started something that I never would have done if I hadn't been surrounded by several of the recent, of our recent alums. Um, it's something that's totally outside of what I normally write, but I figured I'd give it a shot. The Price of Silver. Martin sold his silver-plated Bowie knife the day Alexis Finley tweeted from her Malibu home that she was a werewolf. Martin took it to the pawn shop in Grover. He got $45. He spent 120 three years before. Now the only things left in his go bag were his uncle's revolver and six silver bullets. Most people would think a nine millimeter would be the best gun for hunting werewolves with 15 rounds per clip, but it isn't cost efficient. Like all businesses, it comes down to brass tacks or more metallurgically precise silver bullets. With the market so volatile, and let's face it, all signs show it's going to get worse. Silver on a good day is 54 cents per gram. A bullet weighs 135 grams. That's $72.90 a bullet, $347 for a loaded six-shot revolver, but that's today. When you look back to April 2011, it was $1.57 a gram. The bullets weighed the same, but it cost $211.95 per bullet and $1,271.70 for a loaded revolver. A 15-shot 9mm would cost over $3,000 at the height of the market. It was pure overhead. No one was gonna pay a werewolf hunter more during the housing crisis. So Martin had to make a decision. He became a better shot, which meant less bullets. It meant he could keep his rates lower. He was willing to make changes. He was willing to get in close, use his knife. He was willing to do body work. It was more dangerous, but it kept him in business during the lean times. A lot of werewolf hunters closed up shop back in the financial crisis. They became bodyguards, bouncers at clubs in the cities. Of course, you can guess what happened. When a predator goes unchecked, has no natural enemies, it multiplies. Look at the Indian mongoose in Cuba. When Martin stayed in business and business was good, he continued to cut costs. 
he didn't overhaul his van for 100,000 miles like he should have. He ate more Stouffer's. He made coffee at home. He never had health insurance. As the price dropped, Martin was able to start making gains again, and there's plenty of hunting to be done. He started getting calls as far as Stafford and Van Buren. Then the administration started hearing rumbles and complaints. There was grainy cell phone footage. For centuries, werewolves had attacked livestock, but didn't kill many humans. It happened every once in a while, but usually a sow went missing or a cow was slaughtered in a barn somewhere out in the sticks. A hundred years ago, farmers blamed mountain lions and wiped them out. The full moon had always been a coincidence or a celestial explanation of why the lions were so daring. But cats hadn't been seen in Stafford since 1978. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Our next reader is Kaylee Jones. Kaylee is a novelist and a memoirist. Uh, she, and an editor. She is the author of Lies My Mother Never Told Me, A, daughter, a Soldier's Daughter Never Cries, Celeste's Ascending, and Speak Now. Uh, this semester, she is teaching dystopian fiction uh, in the graduate program. Uh, welcome, Kaylee. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Um, I am uh, going to read from uh, one Last Lunch, which is um, an anthology uh, that was put together by Erica Heller, Joe Heller's daughter. And it's a final meal with those who meant so much to us. And um, so uh, having lunch, an imaginary lunch with um, a, dead, a dead person. So <clears throat> I'm going to read you just the first uh, page, page and a half. Guadalcanal, January 1943. I push aside the flap of the hospital tent, carrying a backpack over my shoulder, and I'm hit with the smell of old blood and perspiration. The not so badly wounded soldiers are restless in sleep, those who can sleep. Some stare out vacantly, groaning from time to time. I walk down the aisle between the cots. They're still wearing their filthy, stinking combat fatigues and boots, as if they're expecting to have to run for cover at any moment. They don't see me because I don't belong in their fever dreams, only in my father's. I find him in the before last cot lying on the left, his back lying back with his arms folded behind his head, one knee bent toward the ceiling. I recognize the pose before the young face that looks ancient and drawn under the head bandage. His slim, almost too slight body is alien to me. He was a featherweight boxer in his regiment before the war, not broad-shouldered and muscular as I remember him from later in life. I crouch beside him, look into his feverish, startled eyes and murmur, I'm your Athena, born whole from your mind. Don't be afraid. What the f he cries, ready to defend himself, his hands flying out in fists from behind his head. He smells of sweat and old cigarettes, but the smell is familiar. As a little girl, I would go to my parents' bedroom late at night, frightened by a nightmare, and hear my father mumbling urgently in his sleep, warning someone to watch out, watch out. He'd awaken with a start as soon as I stepped into the room, a sixth sense born of the war. I'd crawl up and snuggle in between my parents, and he smelled like this. Now, I grasp his hand. My touch seems to calm him, and he doesn't pull away. You have malaria, I tell him in a low, comforting voice. You have a high fever. Look at my face. Don't you recognize a Jones when you see one? How did you? He carefully brings his left hand to his head and feels the bandage, wincing, blinking rapidly as if to clear his mind. You're having a fever dream. I'm old now, I tell him. In my timeline, you've been dead for many years. Somewhere behind me, a sh soldier shouts in his sleep, move, move, God damn it, you son of a bitch. His eyes go out of focus as he considers, thinking hard. When he was thinking hard, when I was, when I was a girl, his left eye would cross slightly, just like it is now. It smells awful in here, I say. Let's go outside. I brought you a picnic, a picnic lunch. I lift the backpack from the floor so he can see it. Lunch, 
It's the middle of the goddamn night. It's lunchtime where I am. He says uncertainly, but are you real? I exist, I say, but just not yet. He slowly with great effort pulls his legs over the side of the bed and sits up hunching, getting his bearings. Finally, he sighs and pulls himself up to standing with the help of my arm, his knees still wobbly. He's limping quite severely as we head toward the tent's back flap. Your twisted ankle is all messed up. You have torn ligaments and your ankle is swollen to twice its size. And I know you wrapped it and I know you don't wanna tell them because it seems like so little compared to the rest, compared to the others. I nod back over my shoulder towards the cots filled with the not so badly wounded soldiers the more seriously wounded ones have already been evacuated by air or hospital ship. The ones who are still here, these ones have been deemed fit to return to combat. Tomorrow, my father will be sent back up the line. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for sharing. All right, our next reader is Robert Lopez. Robert Lopez is the author of the novels Part of the World, Can Be Belongo Mean River, and All Back Full, and the short story collections Asunder and Good People. Uh, last semester, I missed his multi genre class, um, Social Justice in Fact and Fiction. Um, so here's Robert. Thank you, Ariana. And indeed, it is a real pleasure to be here tonight with everyone. I'm gonna read a short suite of fictions uh, titled, However Many Sayings to Live and Die By. What Not to Do, How Not to Live. Don't get born, don't be a person. Don't get born as a person to a family of people. Don't be black or white or brown, and don't be short or fat or skinny. Don't be a brother or sister or cousin or uncle or mother or father. Don't go to school or get a job or consult with colleagues or attend meetings. Never sit at a table where other people are already seated. A Church by Daylight. This the sky is not up in the sky and the moon is no longer the moon and there are no trees or dogs or electric fans or kitchenware and there is no daylight savings time because there is no daylight to save. Some other metal than earth. There might still be dirt and air and mountains, but it doesn't seem possible if there's no sky up in the sky and no moon hanging in the middle of it. Just as carrots don't seem possible, though they grow in the same dirt. But the dirt carrots grow in is called soil, and there's likely no soil. There's no way to di differentiate dirt from soil if there is a difference. There's no optimal time to grow carrots in either dirt or soil because there are no seasons. There's no fall and no spring, which is what's best for carrots. But carrots need fertilizer and there's probably no fertilizer. The world must be peopled. Go to a place called road and try to make a life there. Learn a trade, be a plumber like the guy in that movie or an electrician like the guy in that other movie or be a carpenter like Jesus, even though people say that Jesus couldn't have been a carpenter because there was a paucity of trees in Galilee so he must have been a mason. The gun is where any can find it. You live in America, so there are guns. Always have your guns with you. Take them with you to school and to work and to the movies and to the mall and to the barber or beauty shop. Have a gun for your right hand and a gun for your left hand and keep one tucked inside a boot or shoe. Only a certain kind of person looks at a lowercase r and sees a gun. Always be that kind of person. Thank you. Thank you. So 
we are coming up toward the end of our program this evening. We have two more readers. Um, and I just wanted to remind our viewers, if you do have any questions, feel free to um, type them into the YouTube chat. We'll try and get to maybe a couple. Um, so you can uh, go ahead and do that. There is so much love pouring in. I just wanted to let everyone know on the chat. I don't know. Um, I don't know if all our readers have the chat open on their computers, um, but so, so, so much love coming in from the community. Um, so our next reader is Susan Scarf Merrill. Uh, Susie's the author of Shirley, a novel, a member of the family and the accidental bond, how sibling connections influence adult relationships. She is the uh, she co-directs the Southampton Writers Conference. She also co-directs uh, Stony Brook's novel incubator program called Bookends. Susie, welcome! I can't wait to hear what you have to read. Thanks, Ariana. Um, I have to say, I would also co-direct this reading if I could, but I've decided not to because just co-direction is my thing. So yesterday in my um, novel class, we were talking about ways to locate a story in history without full exposition. And so I just pulled a tiny piece of the book I'm working on out for the students in my class and the rest of you have to listen along. Um, there's almost nothing you need to know. This is a this is about a this is a novel about a group of friends, five friends, three boys, two girls from very early in their lives to kind of late 30s. By eighth grade, it was clear Petey would always be the cute one. It was as if he had his own signature music. When he entered a room, everyone looked up. He was only a little taller than me. So thin, it looked as if, as if his khakis might slide off his narrow hips at any moment. His eyelashes were so long they brushed his skin. You never knew if he was teasing or serious because his voice was always the same, his gaze even, his smile only hinted at. All the girls liked him best. We were scared for him and we wanted to save him and we wanted his approval, but he only wanted Cress. We felt older, the world's troubles had become visible. The summer before, a newscaster named Christine Chubbuck had shot herself in the middle of her newscast. At the time, we'd barely noticed, but now, a year later, Petey sometimes grabbed the thin layer of skin on his upper arm and pulled it, saying he felt kind of Chubbuck. I worried about him. In my way, I was in love with him. I was also in love with Danny. Somewhere in height between Nils and Petey, his hair dark black, his eyes deep, his smile genuine. Not skinny or large, not loud, not strange. He lacked Petey's irony and Nils's genius, but animals and children loved him. His hands were always scabbed from something, working with his do dad, soccer, a scared dog. You have the ugliest hands, I would say, and he would nod as if it was the highest compliment. Yours are so pretty, he'd answer. And sometimes he would raise my hand and bring it to his lips as if we were royalty. And it's true, I was in love with Nils. His brain was the sharpest one. His father had worked with a scientist named Stanley Milgram at Yale when they were doing an experiment where students were ordered to hurt other students and they obediently followed orders. Nils was broad shouldered and tall, soft, always sweating, always trying too hard, ruddy and big handed. You felt as if he could stick to you by accident. He was the smartest of us, most reliable. Teachers asked him to mind the class if they had to leave the room. That he would grow into his nose, his mouth, his shoulders, his gait was not apparent to me when we were young. One Monday at lunch, Nils told us about the experiments, how college students were crying when they pressed the button to shock another student. Girls threw up, he said. Even Cress found this interesting. Did they do it, she asked? Yes, he told us, they'd press the button all the same. Nils couldn't get over this. He'd always wanted to be an inventor, but maybe he would be a scientist instead to make people follow orders, Petey said, pinching his chubbuck with a nasty smile. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our final reader for this evening is Paul Harding. Uh, Paul is a novelist and uh, author of Enon and Tinkers, which won the 2010 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. At Stony Brook, he teaches Beginning the Novel, which uh, Susie has sort of the sister class, the long arc, uh, which I forgot to mention. Um, and Paul also teaches the Old Testament as literature and Shakespeare. Paul, take it away. Thank you, Ariana. Um, it's a great honor and very humbling to um, read with so many incredible um, writers um, and, and <laughs> Reading at the end of a lineup like this um, reminds me of back, uh, had a past life as a drummer in a rock band. And when we used to play, when we first used to play at the old club in New York, CBGBs, we would, um, we, our sets would always, um, we, would, we, we would have the prestige of, um, of playing a set after the headliner had played and everybody had left the club at four in the morning. So I kind of feel like that. I'm feeling a little nostalgic. Um, I was gonna read a page or two from the novel that I'm working on right now. It's gonna be published next summer, um, but we're not on speaking terms at the moment. So I'm going to um, just read a couple pages from my first novel, uh, Tinkers. Uh, this is just a, the first time in the novel you just see a particular character, so. Howard Aaron Crosby drove a wagon for his living. It was a wooden wagon. It was a chest of drawers mounted on two axles and wooden spoked wheels. There were dozens of drawers, each fitted with a recessed brass ring, pulled open with a hooked forefinger that contained brushes and wood oil, tooth powder and nylon stockings, shaving soap and straight edge razors. There were drawers with shoe shine and boot strings, broom handles and mop heads. There was a secret drawer where he kept four bottles of gin. Mostly back roads were his route dirt tracks that ran into the deep woods to hidden clearings where a log cabin sat among sawdust and tree stumps and a woman in a plain dress and hair pulled back so tight that she looked as if she were smiling, which she was not, stood in a crooked doorway with a cocked squirrel gun. Oh, it's you, Howard. Well, I guess I need one of your tin buckets. In the summer, he sniffed Heather and sang, I'll see you in my dreams and watched the monarch butterflies up from Mexico. Spring and fall were his most prosperous times, fall because the backwoods people stalked up for the winter. He piled goods from the cart onto blazing maple leaves. Spring because they had been out of supplies, often for weeks before the roads were passable for his first rounds. Then they came to the wagon like sleepwalkers, bright-eyed and ravenous. Sometimes he came out of the woods with orders for coffins, a child, a wife wrapped up in burlap and stiff in the woodshed. He tinkered, tin pots, wrought iron, solder melted and cupped in a clay dam, quicksilver patchwork. Occasionally a pot hammered back flat, the tinkle of tin sibilant tiny beneath the lid of the boreal forest. Tinkerbird, coppersmith, but mostly a brush and mop drummer. Tinker, tinker, tin, 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 tin tenabulation. There was the ring of pots and buckets. There was also the ring in Howard Crosby's ears, a ring that began at a distance and came closer until it sat in his ears then burrowed into them. His head thrummed as if it were a clapper in a bell. Cold hopped onto the tips of his toes and rode on the of the ring throughout his body until his teeth clattered and his knees faltered and he had to hug himself to keep from unraveling. This was his aura, a cold halo of chemical electricity that encircled him immediately before he was struck by a full seizure. Howard had epilepsy. His wife, Kathleen, formerly Kathleen Black, of the Quebec Blacks, but from a reduced and stern branch of the family, cleared aside chairs and tables and led him to the middle of the kitchen floor. She wrapped a stick of pine in a napkin for him to bite so he would not swallow or chew off his tongue. You can't swallow your tongue, but people thought you could back then. If the fit came fast, 
She crammed the bare stick between his teeth and he would wake to a mouthful of splintered wood and the taste of sap, his head feeling like a glass jar full of old keys and rusty screws. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for uh, concluding our, our, uh, our reading portion. Um, again, if, and if anyone watching has any questions, feel free to type into the chat. Um, it's really been a pleasure to um, listen to everyone on this. Uh, I guess we're, we're technically on a Zoom call that everyone's watching in from. Um, Really, there's just such great talent, real variety of, of writing styles, topics, just everything. And I think that really showcases what, what it can mean to be a writer. Um, I know that there are people watching who um, may be deciding between coming to our graduate program. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this little taste of what our faculty have to offer. Um, I thought I'd pose a question to our 13 uh, members here. Um, if you could sum up the writer's life in, let's say three words, what would they be? You can just pipe in. Go ahead, Roger. Oh, um... The first two words were humiliation and poverty. I was trying to think of the third, uh, but that, that'll give you the idea. How about isolation? Oh, it's so neutral. But yes, it was, if there was one time that was made for writers, it was COVID. All right, well, speaking of COVID, um, have you all felt, I know there's been kind of mixed talk about whether this pandemic, now it's been a full year, has been productive for you or has it been a, a challenge? Um, and maybe if you could speak to maybe your techniques for getting through. I'll say that it has not been productive for me in terms of creative writing. It's been very productive for me in terms of my relationship with my daughter since we've been together in this, in this new place we bought in San Diego. And in a year that I've been here with her since I came back for spring break and, and everything shut down, we haven't had a single argument. So for me, that's productive, but it's productive in a very different way. The writing has been really hard for me because I wonder if I have anything to say anymore, given that everything I, I've seen and experienced over the last, you know, four years really shocked me almost into complete silence. So I'm going to say I have had almost the opposite experience, Kaylee, except that I also have my daughter living with me and we are also getting along, though we do sometimes fight. Um, but, uh, but I have, uh, I've had an incredibly productive year. I, I'm, I'm actually a little nervous about being released from my bat cave because I am, I have been beholden really in many ways to nobody but myself and my work in really large ways. And it has been really maybe one of the richest years. I mean, a lot of fear and a lot of negative stuff, but it has been a, a really rich year creatively. And also weirdly, I've read a lot, which I people keep saying they can't read and I can't stop. So I don't know, there's no law. I've also read a lot, but it's been a struggle to produce creatively. And I have to say, I'm so glad I was in a, a MFA program. Um, over this last year because it sort of just pushed me to do the work. Um, that's my whole story. But I also want to just um, kind of reprimand myself for saying, uh, talking about productivity because I'm really working on um, kind of separating productivity from our identities. Um, I think 
I don't think it's all that we have to offer. Um, and, if, you know, especially with the creative process, you know, it comes as it comes. And um, yeah, so just want to caveat that. Um, I guess the next question I'll pose to our, our group is, um, is just any advice you have for our incoming students and maybe our, our graduating students? Maybe that's a two part or maybe that's the same advice. I see Patricia McCormick. Oh, Christian's going to say talk. something. I just, okay, thank you. Really take advantage of the time that you have here. Um, I know I know. sometimes people really want to rush through, and there's a lot of reasons to rush through a degree. Um, but if you don't have to rush through, don't rush through. This is your chance to be sort of surrounded by writers in a community that supports writers and for you to really work on the thing you care so much about. So, so don't, don't step on the gas just to get a degree. It's, it's not about the degree. It's about, it's about finding community and, and in doing the thing you love to do and, and actually having the time to do it. Because once you leave, you know, for a lot of you who are maybe taking a couple of years off to do it, you're back in the workforce and, you know, you've got to juggle, you know, 17,000 other things and also your writing. I guess I would say too, uh, it's important to not get too wrapped up in the uh, uh, approval of and the friendship of fancy name writers um, and to, to stay sane and eat your vegetables and keep working. Um, some of the flashy parts of being in a degree program are sometimes kind of distracting. And, you know, it's a, it's not a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And so it's important to sort of stay healthy and, and do the things that you need to do to be productive. You know, the other thing I think that's important for the uh, quarantine time is just to lower your expectations, you know, and know that you're in good company there. And that if you're a drinker to drink a little extra too. I have a couple questions from YouTube. Um, the first one is directed towards Molly. Uh, fascinating combination of genre. Interested to hear how you created or didn't create boundaries between the fiction and nonfiction elements. Is it back on me? Okay. Um, there are boundaries. There are actually pretty clear boundaries. In the beginning, it starts out as nonfiction, um, as basically a love song to reading and writing. And um, then uh, sort of, you know, nonfiction essay about how I like how I came to reading, how I came to writing, and then the difficulties <laughs> that uh, we encounter and like a sort of dark point and then um, I give myself a little pep talk at the end of that. And it's like, just go back to the process. You know, the process will guide the way. Let's see what happens. And then the next page is preface to the novel and the character starts up there and then it just goes back and forth. But there's a lot of slippage at certain points. And what I read tonight is one of those examples. Yeah. Thanks. Um, next question directed for Susie Merrill. Love the use of we in the piece. Almost didn't think an I would emerge. Curious if this piece is sort of like the waves for you in a, in a way. <laughs> oh, Felix. <laughs> um, Felix loves the waves. Uh, and uh, we read it last semester. Uh, no, not at all actually they really are a we this is a this is a five sum that is almost almost has a single identity and this this little piece that i read is as the identities are starting to um separate and they are starting to become less a group and more five individual people because they've been friends since they were in first grade and they really are a little cult so the we is ending right now actually but thanks, Felix. 
All right, and uh, this is a question um, for Patty and everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Patty, for sharing your candid experience with that stunning essay. What are some recent pitfalls and victories you have encountered? Hmm. Well, that, that was a pitfall in that that essay didn't get accepted. Um, I actually turned my focus on something completely other when I was um, stalled on these memoir essays and that was to do some long form journalism. And I uh, hunted down Marianne Vecchio, the girl, the 14 year old girl who's in the Kent State photo, the girl who's kneeling with her arms up in the air. And I wasn't quite sure why I was interested in her. And I think I understood, I'm always interested in the teenage experience, whether it's uh, in the young adult novels that I've written, or as you read and heard in my piece tonight about my own coming of age. And I wondered, what it was like for her to come of age with this incredible glare of attention on her um, and to be so unformed. She was a runaway who just happened to be at Kent State to be so completely uh, naive and innocent and to land in the middle of the most, one of the most dev divisive moments in our history. And so I spent a lot of time interviewing her um, and that piece is going to be in the Washington Post Sunday Magazine in the spring. But it was just fun to follow that curiosity. Um, and I was lucky that she was willing to talk to me. Thank you. Um, I feel like we've all been here for a little while this evening and maybe some of us haven't had dinner. Um, I wanted to just open the floor for any last thoughts or words you wanted to share before we uh, conclude our program. And if not, no pressure. All right, I feel like everyone said what they needed to say perhaps in their readings. Um, again, thank you everyone. I wanna just list off the credits of our readers today because just amazing. Um, we started with Amy Hempel, Genevieve Slide Crane, Michelle Whitaker, Susan Minot, Roger Rosenblatt, Molly Godry, Matthew Clam, Patricia McCormick, Christian McLean, Kaylee Jones, Robert Lopez, Susan Scarf Merrill, and Paul Harding. So thank you all. Thank each of you for sharing. Um, and I look forward to doing this maybe in the fall in person. Um, so have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday evening. Thank you, Stony Brook University and the MFA program for putting this together. Have a good night.